Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, hi, all. We have today another session of our reading club uh, of the local series. Today we have uh, three colleagues presenting their work. They are going to be presenting, or, but they have been working in different uh, events. The ICS, uh, ISC, sorry, the ISC and the RIS5 uh, submit. The, we will try to give them the same time they will have, and we will appreciate for you if you have any question at the end. We will have uh, five minutes for questions. Yeah, it's important for them not only to present, but also to have some feedback, to, to be prepared to, to answer your questions, because uh, probably when they present, there are going to be questions. So in order to make, to make this a, a fair exercise, we will ask you to finish that, not to make some, <laughs> some questions. So our first speaker today is Gopina Mahale. Gopina, well, among other stuff, has a PhD in electronic system engineering from the Indian Institute of Science in 2017. He's now a, a researcher at the BSc, and previously he has worked uh, in, in wiper technologies as a research associate. Uh, he has also worked as a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Paderborn in Germany, and as a staff engineer in the Samsung Advanced Institute of Technology in, in India. By right now he's working uh, in domain-specific hardware acceleration, machine learning, low-power computation for deep learning, algorithm architecture co-design, and high-performance computing. So let's let's give him now. Uh, a lot of me is not hearing anything online. Um, that will be the Carolina was definitely online. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I can hear you. Okay, can someone else from the host confirm us that are, you are hearing us? Someone not Carolina? <laughs> just, just to be sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's probably, yeah, yeah, I will. You can start now. Okay. Thank you, Elias, for the introduction and uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'm going to present a work in progress with um, optimization for very long and sparse vector operations on RISC V VPU. Uh, this is going to be presented at uh, an international workshop on RISC V for HPC, it's going to be held with uh, ISC in Hamburg next week. I you keep in the presentation and now you start. Ah, it's, it's okay. Yeah. With the background motivation for this work, uh, I'm going to um, give a brief introduction to the ACME architecture and uh, um, the baseline vector processing unit that we have initially. And on that, we have some enhancements that are uh, specific to supporting sparse vector operations and very long vector operations that I'm going to uh, describe. And then some modifications that we have done to integrate it in FPGA uh, for a free implementation to integrate in a uh, many core uh, framework and uh, how to run some risk five instructions on this setup, something I'm going to uh, describe in the next slides. Finally, some preliminary results and some summary and I'll conclude. The presentation. The vector operations involve vector loads and stores from memory, and even the vectors are dense, unit stride access of those vectors are cache friendly. That is, you bring a cache line from the memory and you have it in cache. So in, initially there is a cache miss, you bring the cache line to the cache, and then you can use, uh, there is a special locality where a single uh, cache line accessed, you have you can use multiple uh, elements next to that, or you can uh, there is a temporal locality where you can use the uh, the same elements uh, in time, multiple times. Right? So uh, in unit stride, it is possible. In non-unit stride, uh, there you bring a cache line, but very few elements from that cache line might be used. So there is a lot of redundant data being transferred on the knock, and it's not cache efficient. And uh, looking at the spark vector operations. SPMB, for example, now the 
the operation involves multiplication of a sparse matrix with a dense vector. Now, the sparse matrix is generally encoded in the form of or compressed in the form of CSR, the CRS, compressed row storage format. And uh, if you look at the operation, basically, it involves multiplication of a particular element from the sparse matrix, which is shown below here, with the exact index of uh, from the dense vector that is x here. I can not take uh, yeah the same the, this element with the first one and this element with the this element with the fourth one right. So you in memory the matrix A is in dense form. You get it with the uh, compute units. It is fine. But when you access the elements uh, from the x that particular elements that involves a gather operation. That is you have the index. You go to the memory and bring the entire cache line. That is again a sparse access to the memory and this is not efficient. And looking at the density of uh, practical uh, sparse matrices, it is generally less than 1%, that is uh, super sparse. And, uh, and one more thing to look at is that the vectors, the dense vector, if it is not able to fit in the cache, then it gets replaced uh, because there is possible reuse of the same vector for different rows of the sparse matrix, right? So if it does not get, uh, it, it cannot fit, then it, it, it will get replaced when uh, uh, next time the uh, other and the rest of the part of the vector uh, is accessed again. So that's an issue. And uh, yeah, so uh, another thing is that uh, the larger, when we, if you look at the lar large memory, uh, long memory instructions, the instruction which involves long, uh, long vector instructions, which involves long vectors, at the time, uh, this results in a larger dynamic memory window. So it means that so uh, the memory controllers have requests from different locations of the uh, sparse matrix and the different locations of the vector. And it can, uh, some of the requests uh, correspond to the same row of the DRAM, let's say, then it can coalesce them and bring the data together. So the memory to put is into. So that's the benefit we get from the long vector. So these changes are targeted in the ACME architecture. So uh, ACME targets dense unit stranded ops, which are cache friendly, and dense non unit stranded ops, which and, and sparse vector ops, which are not cache friendly. And uh, long vectors are targeted here. So basically, the, <clears throat> the architecture consists of the com number of tiles, the computer tiles, which involves, uh, which have, which consists of number of uh, computer cores, as shown here, uh, with a shared IA2 uh, cache. Each core consists of a scalar core with number of uh, accelerators. VPU is one of the accelerators. And these, these accelerators are connected over OVI. OVI is Open Vector Interface uh, from Senate Dynamics. And uh, VPU is the topic of uh, discussion or, or the, the topic of this paper. In, in the baseline implementation, we have a baseline VPU, uh, which is taken from an EPAC project. And uh, this <coughs> VPU consists of uh, a number of vector lanes, each lane having its own vector register file and uh, 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 com compute, uh, uh, compute the logic. Uh, the instructions are issued over OVI and they go through the decoding, vector renaming, instruction. There are two instruction queues, memory queue and arithmetic queue. And uh, there is a reorder buffer which uh, enables in order issue and out of order completion. So, uh, there are enhancements provided with on this VPU to uh, facilitate the long vector and sparse vector support. Other than compute tiles, there are memory tiles which are close to the memory, which perform, uh, uh, which provide a path to the memory, which bypass L1 and L2 cache. So these sparse operations do not get benefited by the cache. So there is, it is possible to uh, bypass the cache and have a separate path for that, dedicated path for that. And uh, basically, uh, memory tile handles L2 cache miss when we are not bypassing cache. Right? And TL, L1 TLB misses and vector loads and store requests from the VPU. That is uh, important here because that's from here is where, where we get most of the benefits. And also, the memory tile can speculate to non speculatively prefetch vector data. For example, now there is a um, um, requested vector length, it is the application vector length from the application. Now the 
uh, the accelerator will know that, okay, although there is a granted vector length which is less than that, but there is still some other elements going to be requested later. So it can prefetch the data, which are in the same, if which could uh, happen to this, uh, be in the same row of the data, right? You can prefetch them and keep it uh, with you. And then when the next uh, request appears, then you can uh, provide it with lesser latency. Now looking at the enhanced BPU, the enhancement that we have provided. So we have increased the number of lanes uh, from eight to 16 uh, and reduced the number of uh, size of the VRF under every lane. Okay. Uh, this is, and then the vector layer, the lanes are paired as a vector lane pairs. The each could, could actually in future, they should be able to uh, execute a thread of vector instruction in future, but currently the multi-threading is not supported here on the VPU. Uh, there is a lot of, now in the baseline, we have VRF on the vector lanes. Now we have uh, in the act name, what we call this enhanced uh, VPU, uh, we have a bigger VRF outside, which is called long vector register file, which is here. This also maintains a 32 vector registers as per the disk file specifications. And there are additional registers, uh, eight registers that we are using for renaming. So totally it is uh, 40 registers. And it, um, it can operate on two modes of operation. First is the classic mode, which uses the cache hierarchy and is the normal operation of the baseline. Right? And there is an ACME mode, which uh, bypasses the cache hierarchy and uh, which is very specific for this, uh, the enhancements. Now, when to use classic mode is something that is uh, that uh, uh, if, if uh, we are getting benefit from cache, right, then go for the uh, classic mode. If not, then for ACME mode. That, that's something that we, we should follow. And also, uh, the, the, the way the computation happened here is that the long vector uh, stays here in the LVRF rewrite manager. So this is the VRF for the ACME mode, for this mode of operation. Now, uh, the, when there is an instruction here, uh, instruction is issued, then the, these lanes configure, uh, or these lanes, uh, uh, these lanes receive the data from uh, the LVRF, a part of data, a fragment of data from LVRF, and process on that and write back. Okay, this is a continue, this is an iterative process. And this data is provided by um, uh, my, something called micro engines, which are small DMA units uh, sitting, they're associated with every vector lane pair. So the way it happens is that this is micro engine shown here in, uh, in color. And the read, read DMA reads 5 bits of data from the LVRF. It gets, the data gets distributed or interleaved between two lanes of a vector lane pair. And then through the fetch buffer, it goes to the vector, uh, vector register file. And then there are, it is forwarded to the operand buffers, to the functional unit, it is written back, uh, the result is written back to a push buffer to the, to the micro engine, okay? So uh, the results are 64 bits from both the lanes. They are together, they together make 128 bits. After four cycles, they are made five till bits and written back. It's very simple. So uh, it's an iterative process until the entire vector length is complete. Okay. And then the, uh, the instruction is committed back to the scalar core. Additionally, there are new interfaces provided to the VPU to speak to the memory tag. Now we are bypassing the cache. Now how to do that, right? So uh, these, these interfaces are very specific to the, the framework where this ACME uh, FPGA implementation is being realized. That is explained in the next slide. So the, for FPG implementation, the ACME, uh, the components of ACME are uh, realized in the, uh, the Open Python, Open Python framework. Here, some of the components of Open Python are uh, replaced with the ACME uh, components. Uh, and uh, as you see here, it, the Open Python has three knocks, knock one, two, and three, and they are used for different purposes. And there is. Uh, <laughs> The, these are uh, two of them, NOC2 and NOC3, are used for sending requests and response from the accelerators. You see here, these are the accelerators, and uh, they can send a request and get a response. Now, what, do, what are those, these requests? Now, uh, on Open Python, you send a message as a, with a message header and a uh, payload. 
right? So uh, what we do is that we, we are sending uh, some custom messages, right? So the, for that, we have defined new message types. Like for VPU, there's a load and store, re uh, store request and their corresponding response that we get from the memory tile. Similarly, from memory tile, you want to send some data to the LVRF, that's a load and store, right? So for that, you have specific uh, message types, and then there is set VL and DLB miss, et cetera. There are additional uh, uh, message types which are not very relevant to what I'm, uh, uh, what I'm presenting today. So open Python uh, NOC uh, supports these, uh, these message types. And other than that, the, for from memory tile to uh, LVRF uh, uh, communication, we have an NOC that is that is that we use prototype network on chip, that is PRONOC. We use this because on open pattern, we have a limitation of message size, which is eight bits are allotted for that. So totally 256 fleets maximum we can have, but we our vectors are large than that. So what we do is we look at uh, PRONOC, which is more flexible, which is more uh, parameterizable. So uh, the, the request and response paths from here, these are these we categorize as CNOC, this control knock and uh, VNOC. Uh, the PRONOC uh, the, from memory tile to LVRF is called VNOC. Now, how to run the instructions with that, right? Just uh, some examples. Basically, vector memory instructions, non-indexed vector loads and stores. So the, the instructions are queued in memory queue, right? and then the, they are sent to the memory tile as a memory request, load or store request. If it's a load, then memory tile in turn, uh, actually it reads the data uh, first. It has a, it gets a virtual address. It translates to a physical address, then reads the data from the memory and uh, uh, sends a write request to the VNOC. That's a write request. We have to write to the uh, LVR, right? And LVRF receives it, writes to LVRF. There is a LVRF read write manager, sorry. LVRF read write manager here, it writes to the LVRF and then sends a response saying that the write is done then through a response, right? And then memory tile uh, respond back to the VPU saying that, yes, the operation is done. And once the VPU receives it, it, it updates the uh, register scoreboard where it says that the register is available in the LVRF. Now we can go ahead with other instructions which are dependent on this, uh, this register. And uh, if it is a store, it's the other way around. So uh, uh, memory tile uh, asks for a data and LVRF responds with the data and memory tile writes the uh, memory, right? The non-memory instruction, arithmetic instruction, as I said, it is it will be an arithmetic queue. Whenever the, the um, there is a register scoreboard, the bits are available. It understands that the register is ready, so it uh, gets issued on the vector lanes. The memory, the micro engines are enabled, and then they bring the data. You process on the data, and uh, you write back the results. Once it is done, the uh, the the scoreboard is updated that the 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 destination register is available now for the next uh, instructions which are dependent on that, right? Uh, but uh, there, there are gather instructions, right? VR gather and slide instructions, which are a bit different from uh, these. So uh, these, these uh, gather is basically uh, indexed uh, read and indexed uh, more, right? So uh, basically, this is this involved. in the baseline implementation. What uh, the the VPU what it does is that. Uh, it has entire vector in the VRF, so it can uh, it have it has access to all the elements, right? Any any position. But in our case, the entire entire vector is in LVRF, and we have only fragment of that, so we don't have visibility of the entire vector. So what what to do with that? So uh, instead of bringing the uh, vector set fragment to the VPU, since we are we are not doing any computations on that. It's just a kind of shuffle uh, operation. So instead of that, we what we do is that we have enabled uh, MEs to micro engines to perform that operation near the LVRF itself without bringing it to the VPU. So uh, MEs here, the steps below describe the same. Here the MEs uh, first read the index vector, then the uh, it generate new reads for every index, get the data, uh, pack it into five little bits of data, and write it back to the LVRF. Right, this is the operation. Uh, the slide operation is also handled similarly. It's that the 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 <clears throat> the index is kind of uh, it's a, it's fixed throughout the uh, throughout the operation. Now <clears throat> looking at the master instruction, this actually enables uh, predicated execution of instructions. The arithmetic instruction for arithmetic instruction on the baseline VPU, uh, the APAC VPU, uh, during any 
uh, when whenever some new data is loaded to the V0, V0 vector zero or uh, uh, any 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 instruction writing the results to V0, right? So uh, that that uh, that content of that is up, <clears throat> is loaded to specific registers on every lane. Those are called mask registers. So basically, in risk five vector extension uh, vector instructions, the uh, content of V0 is used as mask for the subsequent instruction. So uh, uh, to do it in our uh, in ACME mode, that is uh, uh, in ACME, the way we have to do is that whenever there is a, a result being written to, uh, being written to V0, we, we can write the same to V0. There is no, not much of an issue. But when there is a, a load to V0 from outside, right? then we need to know that, OK, there is a, a load, load to V0. And we have to enable the micro engines to bring the data from V0 to the, uh, the mask registers on the lane. So that is something we are, we are currently working on and uh, that will be implemented. And uh, for the memory instruction, because memory instruction happen from outside, right? From the uh, from the memory tile to the LVR tile manager, so uh, uh, they do not have access to the mask bits which are on the DPU. So the best they can do is that uh, to read from the V0 from the LVRF and deduce the mask bits from there. Right? So uh, so for a mask load, basically. Uh, initially, the masks are read, and the write to the LVRF is then using the mask bits by generating stored signals and mask uh, for mask store. It's the other way around, but memory tile generates two requests, and it gets a mask and data one after another, and then writes to the memory after that. To verify this, uh, this RTL, since the memory tile is still under development, uh, we use a UVM test bench which mimics the behavior of memory tile. So it receives the request from the VPU. It, uh, uh, according to the uh, request, it writes the data to the LVRF and uh, it res responds to the VPU saying that the data is there and VPU can continue with the uh, instruction execution. And the same instruction is executed on a spike uh, mm -hmm. where uh, uh, it generates some outputs and the outputs are compared and finally we verify the results. With that, we have run some uh, mini IC tests and also some uh, kernels, which are from the benchmark uh, RISC-V vectorized benchmark suit. And uh, most of the uh, four of them are passing. Uh, and uh, one of them is currently, supporting one of them is currently in progress, where uh, where uh, we have master instructions, which are still under, uh, which are supporting them still under progress. And uh, we have some FPGA results. So uh, we have synthesized DPU, LVRF, this long vector register file and uh, the MEs uh, together, and uh, <clears throat> uh, with number of SVC, the number of with the number of lanes, the total LUTs are uh, linearly increasing because the vector numbers take most of the resources. So, uh, the resources also increasing uh, linearly. To to conclude, uh, a summary: uh, ACME architecture handles. Uh, cache friendly and cache unfriendly uh, memory accesses, and the uh, proposed risk by VPU is equipped with the uh, path to bypass the cache, which is uh, wherever it is not beneficial, and uh, larger vector register file uh, to handle long vector long vector operations, and a special request response interface to the memory tile, and. Uh, it is integrated in an open Python framework where new message types are introduced and uh, uh, with the supporting uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, schemes to execute uh, different categories of risk five instructions are um, described in the paper. And, uh, the simulation result with simulation result we can see that it is passing many of the uh, test kernels that we have. Thank you for your attention and uh, if you have I'll be happy to. Uh, answer any of the questions that you may have. Thank you, Gopina. So, does someone has questions for Gopina? We we appreciate. It. Yeah. What? Well, okay. okay. Well, uh, whoa. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you mentioned that you have a vector network on chip, and also a, a open Python has its own network on chip. Uh, my question is that these those network chips are different at the same topology. Or? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, can you please repeat? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that yeah, we have here the open Python network chips that you mentioned you have actually four. Right? Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, my question is, is the same for the vector network on chip or is different? Uh, no, it, it's, it's a different thing. It's okay. a single uh, knock. Yeah, and also it has different topology and everything like that. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. My question is about performance. What is what are you getting compared with the sequential implementation of the applications from the vectorization? Uh, performance we we haven't uh, done it because currently it's uh, we are looking at a working uh, prototype. Okay, so uh, it, we are not a stage where we uh, we can measure the performance at this uh, this one, but we should be able to get the numbers in some time. The change in, between the two modes of operation are indicated by the programmer. I mean, when to use the cache and when to avoid when to avoid the cache. Yes, uh, there are two modes of operation now: uh, classic mode and Acme mode. Uh, currently, uh, this will be this change will be done during compile time is what uh, this this uh, reset time, right? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Good, good time. Sorry. Uh, good time. Yeah, it's good in time because the. Because the, the machine do not know if the input is sparse or is not sparse, for example. Yeah, but uh, we, as a, I think as a user, we have to decide on uh, yeah, yeah, it's decided the, by which the is program. beneficial or not, yes. And uh, what is the shape of the matrices that you are testing? <clears throat> Different shapes of practical uh, matrices have been looked at, uh, but uh, mostly this is Yes, uh, that is uh, a good question actually, like where the non-zero uh, is the randomized. So with the simulations, currently uh, we are trying to understand like what shape of the, or what sparsity, what uh, distribution of non-zeros benefit from uh, caching or non-caching. Right. So uh, basically uh, some, uh, uh, some distribution of the non-zeros might benefit from caching. So, uh, so this is something we have to get from simulations. Okay. And what's the sparsity you're testing? Sparsity, I don't have the right numbers, but probably it's less than one. This is uh, these uh, metrics are taken from a data, uh, database. I, I, I don't have the site, but it's a standard uh, database site from where we get the mass of metrics and we're analyzing. But uh, they, they're not being run on, on any of these, these simulations currently. But uh, uh, in other simulations which model this architecture. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, someone else has questions? I, I have one before. Yeah, yeah, I have one before passing to the online guys. Uh, but as you uh, answered, David, this is in a proof of concept stage yet, not, not having results. When when do you foresee that this will be finished? This is more from the project uh, way point of view. This is this what we have to deliver with me, or is something that we can do after July? So we should be able to. Uh, we should, uh, I think, uh, present some results with the implementation. There are two things. One is uh, the arc. There is a tool named. Koyote, which uh, models this uh, the entire architecture and which has its own numbers, which projects the performance and all. But uh, the, the implementation that I have presented now is on FPGA, right? So it has the micro engine and all uh, the performance of that and everything that needs to be looked at. So uh, that uh, result uh, is possible when we implement it. And uh, uh, by end of this project, we should be able to have some numbers. Uh, if, if we have the entire flow, we should have some numbers. Okay. Thank you. So uh, now someone in the in the room in the on, online has some questions that wants to do. Please mute or put it in the chat if you prefer. Not this time. Okay. Let's send uh, Gopina for his presentation and go for the next one. With the online, huh? Oh, no, online, yeah. Sorry. So now, um, Gonzalo, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay.
I am going to share my screen. Okay. I'll, I'll remove this thing. No, no. Okay, we can see it. Okay, let me put in presentation mode. Okay. okay. I assume you can hear me and you can see the screen. Let me just know. Okay. Uh, wait, let's wait a second, please. But in the room, we yes. cannot see. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I will start presenting you and, and then once we have this the setup, well, you can start. Well, now. Now uh, we have our next presenter. He's also presented his, his work for the ISC. Uh, uh, his name is Gonzalo. Gonzalo is currently a PhD student here at the BSc and the UPC, and he has a master's degree in artificial intelligence from the Universitat of Barcelona, the Universitat Rovira de Virgil, and the UPC at the same time in 2018. Um, and um, well, uh, Gonzalo, I haven't seen you before like the other guys. Uh, you have 20 minutes as we are trying to do the closest to the reality. Uh, I will let you know when you have two minutes to finish and then we will do five minutes of questions. That's okay, okay. with you? Yes, perfect, thank you. So you can start. Perfect, thank you. So hello everyone. Um, so I'm presenting the paper that we have submitted to the IST, and we are going to, to present there. Uh, this paper has been done uh, mainly with my partner, uh, Aaron Cohn, that is uh, also in the room. And also it has been partially in collaboration with the life science uh, department since uh, the, the, genom the, the genomic uh, problem that we are trying to, to use as a benchmark. So detail is challenge and opportunities for these five architectures towards uh, genomic workflow. So first of all, uh, just in case you, some of you are not familiarized with these five and the motivation behind it, uh, this is uh, an European technology, uh, and the motivation behind is that there is no currently uh, European chips um, being used. So RISC five is like like the best from Europe uh, to, to compete with, with these other companies that are mainly from China or, or USA. So some of the, the products have been gone, so the opportunities or challenge of risk five is uh, the first thing is that they advocate for open hardware and open repositories. And some of the challenges in uh, it's also a, a new technology. Uh, there is uh, a lot of lack of support uh, for some softwares and uh, there is uh, not actual hardware for high performing uh, such as in x86 that uh, architectures so just to summarize a bit our contributions on the paper that we presented uh, the first uh, is the development of a, a benchmark architecture application for risk 5 that it's uh, also it's a real application that is being used uh, to, to genomic data sets and we have tested with uh, data that is not real because we cannot use it because of privacy but it's uh, equivalent to the real so it's a real problem then we have identified which are the challenge um, of the of uh, risk five architecture comparing uh, the executions with x86 uh, then we had some discussion of uh, what we think it could be the, the, the route for future work uh, for risk fight towards uh, improving the performance in this kind of, of environments. And finally, uh, we have created uh, an open data repository with the benchmarking that we have developed, uh, so anyone can, can test it also. So now I'm going to give you a brief explanation of the genomic workload that is called variant interaction analysis. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible, but I want you to understand a bit the problem, uh, just to understand which are the, the needs of the problem and a better understanding of the benchmarking and the results. So uh, the, the genomic problem 
uh, that we are trying to, to solve with uh, our application is the relation of complex disease that can be asthma, diabetes, or Alzheimer or other difference and the direct relation with the small variations on the on the human genome. The problem always that we are uh, dealing with the human genome is that with uh, the, the amount of data available is huge. So we are always working with with a big data problem. Uh, so more concretely, we are trying to, to check also the, the interaction effect of different variants. That it means that maybe you have uh, some, some variants in one part that is not significant, but when you have another one, uh, you have a disease. So to understand the data that we are, we are using, uh, just uh, what is interesting here is the structure. Uh, we are dealing with a row, uh, every row is a variant and every row is composed by the, the value for all the patients. And we are having uh, a bit more of 1,000 patients. The original data set was 2 million pairs, but in order to test it in a risk five in a feasible amount of time and comparison, uh, we have cut it up and we have we are only, only using uh, less than a thousand. And then what we are trying to classify is these samples with the labels. That means case is someone that has a disease and control is someone that is healthy. So this is the like the the main scheme of the application. I will go step by step just briefly to understand the operation that are coming into account, but just to understand the flow of the problem. In the first step, we are doing a cross validation uh, division of the of the data in five uh, five fold cross validation. In the second step, we are going to do this. Uh, combinations of the different variants and we are looking for the interaction between variants we have to check uh, how, how they interact between each other and we are building a contingency table of the cases and controls for each of the possible combinations so uh, just uh, for your knowledge uh, every variant can have uh, three different um, values so we are dealing with a uh, one hot encoder of zero uh, or three three two locations so then when we have this contingency table for each of the possible combinations that we are having in the data set this is one of the main problems that uh, since the genome is quite big if we have to do also all the combinations possible the data grows exponentially so we are going to classify these different locations and build some classifiers from these contingency tables that is going to, to be like a binary classifier. If you have this position and this position, and if a knight that is high risk uh, is going to classify as a, as a case, as someone with a disease, and if, if it's uh, a low risk, it's going to classify as a healthy person. The way this threshold is decided is just uh, dividing the amount of cases between the amount of controls, and if that position has more cases than controls is going to be high risk, and if it starts less, it's going to be low risk. Then from each of the classifiers, uh, we are going to classify all the patients that we have on the test set, and we are going to get a prediction error. And finally, our system is going to sort this uh, prediction error for all the possible combinations in all the possible cross-validation, and it's going to, to build this, this table of the sorted uh, pairs. And it's going to tell us which are the pairs that are more probably linked with the disease. So just I will go briefly uh, at each step. Uh, first, what I said, this is a simple case of cross validation. We pick the patients and we divide in five different sets of training and, and tests. The second part where we build the table, uh, as I was saying, um, these are uh, the chromosomes and, and the variants uh, that can have. So we build uh, the combination of every variant with every variant. And just for your knowledge, uh, when I, we say a SNP is quite similar to variant, this is the position of the variant. And just for notation, uh, these are equivalent. And we build the, the tables uh, using the cases and controls. The, the threshold that I already explained to you, uh, just take into account that sometimes the data set is um, unbalanced. So maybe if we have on the whole data set, we have more cases and controls, this is not going to be 0 0.5 and maybe 0 0.6, depending on the data that we are working. 
Finally, the, the prediction, remember that we have to do this prediction for all the possible combination that we have on the data set and for all the possible cross validations um, sets that we have. And finally, uh, this is the table that I was talking uh, before, and this is the result that we are getting that we are trying to locate those pairs that are uh, selected as top pairs in all the five cross validations. So here you can, the, the x axis, you can see one, two, three, four, five. This means that the pairs that have been located in only one of the cross validation, the ones that have been located in two, in three, or four, or five. So our interest is the ones that have been located on the five of them. So now that you have some idea of, of what we are doing in this benchmarking, uh, let's see the, the results when we compare uh, the performance in RIS-5 and X86. So the setup of the experiment uh, was uh, was this. Uh, we are using uh, four, four high five and matching uh, boards for RIS-5 and just trying to simulate the same environment. We are using four nodes that we simulate in a virtual environment on, on OpenStack. So the first thing that we have some concerns about, uh, since all the operation that I was explaining before implies multiplication of matrix, uh, we, we had our, our application uh, working with a lot of vector operations and uh, uh, five uh, doesn't support these vector operations in the in array. So we compare uh, how how this application using vector operation and not using them uh, was working differently with with RIS5. So here in the x axis you can see how many times it's faster the application in x86 uh, versus RIS5, and uh, in the x axis you can see uh, how changing the number of files uh, affects. Uh, what you can see is that we are finding that it's always faster to use the the vectorial operations against this five. So the conclusion of this experiment was the vector operation as something that will be a first um, implementation for RIS five that will increase our benchmarking um, time. Then uh, we did some experiments uh, with the scalability um, across codes. Uh, this uh, we did some experiment using one core per node, two codes, three codes, or four codes. Uh, and again, the y-axis is uh, how how many times is faster in x86 versus rich five, and also the five. And uh, what we can see here uh, is that uh, we have as much cores we are using the greater is the difference between RIS-5 and X86. We can see how uh, it's scaling in cores in both architectures, but it's scaling better in X86. Then about using more or less nodes, we have tested until three working nodes. Uh, in the left graph, uh, we have the cycle uh, execution uh, time for X86. And in the right graph, we have for this five. And what we can see is while on X86, we are seeing some, uh, it's scaling as much more nodes we are using, the, the time, the cycle decrease. But when we look to risk five, as you can see, it almost doesn't scale out. Uh, at all. And um, using two or three nodes becomes in the, practically the, the same result. So we were a bit concerned about this uh, situation on RIS-5 because uh, we, we suppose that it was going to scale a uh, node and if you have more power, it's going to be faster. Uh, so what we did is uh, trying to look a bit uh, deeper in what was happening in, in our workload. So we analyzed for RIS-5 uh, the times of the saving, the load and the running of our application. So first, uh, it's the, the load when you load the data, then you run the application and you do save the results. So what we found here, if we look only into the running time, that is the, the dark blue, the first, the first uh, uh, color, uh, you see that for one uh, node versus two nodes, it decreases, and from two to three, it also decreases a bit, but it decreases. 
However, the saving and loading time is increasing. Uh, so the, the thing that is um, messing with our running time when we increase the nodes is the loading and the saving time, not the running time. So uh, some conclusions and some thoughts about uh, what the future world could, could be for risk sites for this kind of uh, applications. The first, the first thing that we conclude is that uh, vectoral uh, inclusion are something that uh, could help covering the gap between x, xp6 and risk sites. Not all the gap, but it's something that could, could decrease this gap. Uh, the second thing that was uh, referring to the last class I, I showed you is that uh, data loading process uh, is quite expensive in a risk fight, and it's what has been causing us problems to, to decrease our computational time increasing the nodes. Something that we had in mind uh, was implementing some um, file distributed file system, a Hadoop uh, distributed file system. Uh, that could uh, distribute this data prior to the workload of the execution. And that way we can avoid this uh, loading time that we have to, to, to spend on the running time. Uh, we had also some problems uh, when measuring uh, this kind of data of uh, our application because uh, implementing other more complex ways of measuring the, the times of each step uh, was messing with our real time, uh, so we were, wasn't able to acquire valid and detailed uh, times about this this part. Um, so other thing is that uh, we try to simulate a similar environment, uh, but it's difficult to to find uh, something that is completely equivalent. So something that will be nice, it will be also facilitating this, this, this kind of things uh, to, to be able to compare better. Um, for, uh, for using risk five as becoming a, a new standard, uh, we need to, to implement uh, technologies that allow real users to, to implement the, their applications here. So, uh, this is a, a case where we can see that a real application uh, has some real disadvantage uh, in this five versus uh, x species, and there is a lot of that that need to be covered, but it's something that is uh, a work in progress. So that's all. So thank you very much for your attention, and I don't know if you have uh, any questions. Please go ahead. Thank you, Gonzalo. So in the room, does someone has any question? Uh, are these workloads more memory bound or compute bound? Are mainly compute bound in the way that they are distributed. Do you know how, how much is the balance, like 60, 40 or 70, 30? Uh, I don't know the the balance. Uh, the thing is, we had some issues with the memory when we were developing the the application, but we decided to go one uh, combination at a time. That way, it, uh, it's not using almost memory. So it uh, since it's loading one by one, uh, it's, the memory is quite insignificant for this application incomplete. Okay, in, in the vectorization, did you use handmade vectorization for x86? Or it for, was the auto-compilation? Auto yeah, for, for, well, so all the code is uh, done in Python. So for x86, we were using uh, NumPy uh, from Python directly. Okay, okay. And finally, uh, did you run some test in the, using DDR4 or just DDR3? Uh, I think I don't will answer better this part. I think it's for DDR4. Yeah, that's, that we just use the default memory on, on the system. We didn't test different kind of memories. Okay. Well, that, that's all right. Like anyway, the data set had to be run so much, so made it so small that it could run properly on this five because of the performance issues. The memory is not really 
in a real world scenario where you have the full data set with all the patients, it will be a problem because it's a huge data set. And that's why this world of is using Spark. Spark optimizes the point of moving data into memory. But in this place, in the scenario where you have to make the data set so small that it fits into memory, it means that memory is already not used and it only computes it. That's why testing different kinds of memories in this precise scenario doesn't make sense. In a real world scenario, it could make a lot of sense. Yeah, it's because, uh, well, in the in my short experience, because I don't have much, but the only access I had it was for RISC-5 DDR4, and I saw that you are using for x86 DDR3, which is a little bit old. Yes, because we had only access to the OpenStack North 3 computers that BSC provides. Ah, okay. We didn't have access to better x86 environments. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, anyone else in the room? Uh, Gonzalo, we have another question in the in the chat from Mark Tola. He's asking, what's the underlying uh, machine learning framework use? Uh, so yes, I didn't mention, I think Aaron just mentioned, we are, we are uh, using Spark and Python and PySpark for uh, all the main operations. Mark also, okay, thanks. Uh, I have a question in the in the slide before the experiment four. Which one, sorry? And the slide before the experiment four, yeah, the slide before that one, yeah. Before experiment, this one? Next, 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 next. Next. Ah, the three. Three yeah. and three? Yeah, that one. Here is it's interesting because you say that it doesn't scale well for risk five, but if I look at the y axis, it's, it's quite different. If if I put well, if I visualize the left one in the same scale that the other one, is 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 even more equal than the one in the right. So you are basing what? your does not scale well on something what? that I that I'm missing. I mean, if well, the one I put it from one to three, the points are even more together than in the right one, right? Yes, but in the in the right one, you even have if you see the the yellow dot is above the the green dot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that it's my question is more I don't know, style one maybe to have it in the same scale will be more you know easy to see. Yeah, the thing is so the problem with the same scale is that since uh, the computation the, the time execution uh, or the cycle execution for x86 is uh, so much lower than RISC-V is very very hard to compare. But when if you compare. This is uh, 0 0.3 versus 0 0.1. It's like almost two times faster. While here, you cannot have even 1.05 faster. OK, OK. And well, and another one is, is just maybe me being uh, too khaki. But well, the, your presentation doesn't need it because it's, well, it's quite beautiful. But I haven't seen. Uh, Four times three. It's four times three. A four times sixteen. Huh? Four three. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I haven't seen a four three presentation in a while. Maybe doing it a sixteen um, times nine will give you, you know, more space because it's, it's yeah, the probability to present it in a widescreen screen is mm -hmm. is high. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thank thank you for the advice. Yes. Yeah. I, I see it now. Thank you for the advice. No, it's okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo. Uh, let's, let's thank Gonzalo and go for the next one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. okay uh, now we have Umer who...
I hope you can hear me. Please, please no. They cannot hear me. Can you hear me now? Uh, we can, because there is some surround sound, some echo. Better now? No, 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 no. No, there is some ego. Now? Yep, that's better. Yep. Thank you. Well, uh, for the last, we will have uh, Umar. Umar will be presenting his work at the RIS 5 submit. You should notice that he has only 15 minutes. Uh, it's, a, well, it's a shorter presentation, but uh, of course we will ask you to also to ask him questions to prepare for what's coming to him. Umar has received uh, his BSc in Electronic Engineering for the University of Engineering uh, Technology in Pakistan in 2018. Since 2018, he has been working in the industry uh, before joining the BSc in 2022, where he's working as an RTL engineer. His expertise lies around digital system, designing in general, and RIS-5 processor in particular. Uh, and now, we will hear oh in 15 minutes yeah. and five for questions. Thank you. I think it's better. Huh? Cool. I'm gonna do in standing position much better. Okay. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. Can you hear me clearly? Yep, yep, yep. No, yep. Perfect. So thank you so much for the introduction, Elias, and thank you so much everyone for attending this talk. So today I'm going to present uh, our work in progress. We are trying to develop, we are trying to improve memory level parallelism in a decoupled execute access vector accelerator. So the outline for the next 15 minutes, I hope, I hope will be like, I'll just walk you through the motivation I have for, or we have for this work. And then I will introduce the memory engine, we call it Midia. And we, we uh, to take a bit deeper, I'll just go through the microarchitecture, the interfaces we have for, for it, and then what kind of requests we support in this in this memory engine, and like some of the, the core building blocks of this memory engine. And at the end, we have some result for it, and I'll show you that result as well. Okay, so coming towards the motivation. The first one is the yeah, efficient use of memory bandwidth, yeah, especially for sparse access patterns. So in, in the performance of like machine learning algorithm or graph-based application is hampered by the inefficient use of memory bandwidth. Why, especially for sparse access patterns. So what we are coming up with, we are trying to make this better. We are using memory bandwidth much efficiently, and we are trying to reduce data movements between compute node and the memory. And to be more precise, I'll explain you, we are actually trying to reduce parasitic data movements. And what does it mean? I'll explain it later. So eventually what we will get is we will reduce the knock traffic uh, with it as well. And to keep the cementing consistent for vector data processing, we are, we are, we are trying to, to deal with the data, uh, vector data much more efficiently by bypassing cache in some ways. And ultimately we are trying to improve memory level parallelism for it with this module. So this is what a classical system looks like. It's like the canonical one. You have a compute node, you have L2 cache and the memory hierarchy. 
So typically, that to cache request is just like the one you have. We, we all have in our system traditional systems. But even for vector loads and store, you can you can see you need to convert your vector loads and store into cache lines. Your vector loads and store now dependent on your cache structure and everything you have the memory hierarchy. So in case of sparse matrices, it doesn't go well if you have too much sparsity. Because if it if your long or sparse vector doesn't fit in the cache, eventually what you will get is cache miss. So what we are trying to come up with, we, we want to keep the semantic of vector data processing consistent throughout the throughout the process, throughout the system for a compute node can can uh, work on vector data much more efficiently. So what we are coming up with with this memory engine media in middle of the compute node and memory. So you can see the cache line transfer. Get sharing the presenter window. Oh, no. oh, okay. Okay. How to change that? Uh, share screen, the other screen. Okay. Need to stop sharing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry for the disturbance. And here we can have a uh, memory engine uh, between compute node and memory node. So here you can see the cache lines are just they are like handed transparently just as before, but now in this case, we are transferring our vector loads and store to memory engine rather than to L2 cache for handling. And here, these, these vectors and load and store are handed locally and much more efficiently than sending them to through the cache hierarchy, especially we are targeting sparse, uh, sparse access patterns. Click on the... Yes. <laughs> You know, click on the PowerPoint and then you can go to the with the arrow. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is a uh, upper view of integration of memory tiles or media in ACME. ACME is kind of a, a RISC-V based architecture, especially for dense and sparse workloads. So here you can see we are shifting uh, the memory accessing responsibility from compute tile to memory engine for decoupled execute access. And here at the last row, you can see there are memory tile talking to memory. And we, we, we all know that VP is commonly known for uh, data level parallelism, but introducing media in the in the system, in the ACME, we are actually enhancing capabilities of memory level parallelism as well. Okay. So this is the micro architecture of uh, media. You can, you, can, you can see that there are like some interfaces we have some core elements like vector fragment sequencer. I'll, I'll explain in, in later on, prefetcher and CPU. So if we just take these uh, elements one by one, if we just remove everything from the logic and we end up having something like this. So we have kind of four interfaces. Can, uh, so our system, our memory engine can connect with, with the external one through, first of all, compute knock. We call it CNOC. On the other side, we have compute node. And in compute node, we have like scalar core and the corresponding VPU. 
on VNOC, we have long vector register file, which is a physical long vector register file. So it's connected through, uh, to connect it to media through VNOC. We have memory crossbar. So with this memory crossbar, all the media, media tiles can connect to, uh, I mean, we can connect all the media tiles with them using this memory crossbar. And then memory controller interface to connect with HBM and RAM. This is local to the, to the typical tile of map to a typical memory tile. Okay. So I think it's worth knowing what kind of requests we can handle in this memory engine. So primarily we can handle four major, four types of uh, requests. The first one is the traditional one, cache miss. So we can, we can handle both like either read or write uh, using this memory engine. We can handle ELB miss as well. So if someone, wants a translation from virtual to physical address, we can we can deal with that because we have our own local TLB inside media, inside the memory engine. These are like the traditional one, but the, the actual purpose where this memory engine comes into play is for vector, vector data processing or vector request process. So we can handle vector loads and vector store. So, and the last one, we, we are also, improves our capability by putting a small core inside the uh, memory engine, and we can deal with memory intensive operation there, like we call atomic memory operation, like mem copy and spin lock in near the memory. So these are primarily the, the four kinds of requests we can deal with uh, inside this, this module, this memory engine. So now coming up, after coming up the interfaces, the, the core elements that, that needs to be addressed is like, this first one is vector fragment sequencer, prefetcher and MCPU. So I think it's better to go in the vector fragment sequencer details. So here, here, this is, here's the purpose of vector fragment sequencer. So the very basic idea is if you have a very long vector and you are bounded by the crossbar data width and bus length, you need to chop that vector into multiple into multiple pieces or fragments. So what frag vector fragment sequencer is doing, is taking the incoming request and chopping down into multiple uh, fragments. So, so you can see we, re we request F1, F1 means fragment one, second fragment third, up to N. N is determined by your memory crossbar data width and bus length, because you know that if the data width is like 64 bits or whatever, you can write only that elements to memory, depending upon the vector length and element width. What's next is every fragment will generate a separate memory transaction, talk to memory, either in case of load or store, and get the, if, it, if it is a case of load, gets back the data from the memory, put together, and write it to LVRF. So we all know that RISC-V vector operation supports uh, falling address mode like unit stride and strided and indexed. So we know unit stride is like managed as dense memory accesses. But our, our memory engine, this, this work is more focused towards sparse memory accesses. So we are much more interested in how to deal strided and indexed modes much more efficiently. So we know that if you if you break down a long vector, a large vector, a sparse vector into multiple fragment, uh, fragments, so there is a possibility that you end up having only one vector element in a fragment because the vector is two sparse. You are getting data back from the memory, and the one and the vector element you get in a fragment could be only one vector element. So what this this memory engine will help you in, it's actually gets the, gets the data back from memory. Without sending, I mean, you can send all the data back to the compute node, but this memory engine will pack them locally, pack them in a dense way so you can write it to, to LBR. For example, uh, you, you end up having one element in, in, in a fragment. Now you are getting back the data from memory. You are collecting all the fragments there near memory. You pack them, and as a dense vector, you, you can write it to LBR, long vector register file. 
So what, where uh, it actually helps, it helps in, as I said earlier, less parasitic data movements because you ultimately need to reject most of the data out of every fragments. So is it better to send it all the way from memory to compute node or remove it there near memory and send only the required data you want to the, to, uh, to the compute node? And what ultimately we will get, we can save energy and we can reduce the knock traffic because we are we are reducing data and we are only sending the required data we, we need to send. So the next element I'm gonna discuss is prefetcher. So you can think of a prefetcher in a way that if application is demanding a request with some application vector length, but we know that we are we have long vector register file, which is a physical register file. So we have some physical constraint, some physical limits. And the granted vector length is actually governed by the, those physical limits. In our case, our memory engine, engine gets both of them. We know what application is demanding and the memory engine knows what is the granted vector length because memory engine knows that we are a physical structure. And now what memory of what media is doing is actually taking the difference, working on, currently it works on the granted vector length, but it knows the difference between application and granted vector length, so it can, non-speculatively, it's not a speculation, it's non-speculatively prefetch rest of the vector length, rest of, rest of the elements. So because eventually the request will arrive soon. Application demanded with certain application vector length, but we know our limit is like due to some physical constraint is granted vector length. But prefetcher will do, will get the rest of the elements non-speculatively because knowing the fact that the request will eventually arrive later on. So this, this is the purpose of having prefetcher inside the memory engine. Then we have a small scalar core inside, inside the engine. What it does is it's actually tightly coupled with memory and it having a low, inter, low latency interface to the memory controller. And it, it is actually there to provide support for memory intensive functions, memory intensive tasks like mempoppy or spin log. So we can, so compute tile can access it and can 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 perform the memory intensive operation on that scalar scalar core. That scalar core is tightly integrated with the memory. So so performing memory intensive operation near memory is much more efficient than taking data all the way back to memory to compute node and then back and forth. So what we will get uh, having this smaller core inside the memory engine, we will get performance improvement energy improvement and we, we can reduce ultimately the knock traffic uh, through this scalar code because we are doing memory intensive operations near memory rather than taking data from the memory to compute node and sending back. So, yes. So to wrap up the discussion, we have a result. So this is a sparse matrix vector benchmark and this is the execution time analysis. So you can see on the x-axis, we have number of elements used and on the uh, y-axis, we have time or cycles. You can see as you increases the number of elements. So without media, the graph is going linearly up, but with, with media, more or less constant, more or less. So the difference is much more visible if you, if you go for uh, if you go for number of elements, I mean, like large value of number of elements. So this is the result we, we get from sparse matrix uh, benchmark to, to the current model. But keep in mind, we don't have prefetcher yet in this model, the result we get. Yeah. So that's it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I can conclude it. So any question? online or here in this room. Yes, I see that you have some PLB as some BTW models inside your design. So my question is that if you are designing and implementing from scratch or are you wasting up some existing design? So we have some existing exist, existing designs in like in open beta we have some okay. already existing design for PLB and, and BTW. Yeah, yeah. We, we will utilize that. So the work is still in progress, but we will 
utilize those because okay. it's already tested and much more yeah, yeah. like actually the rather than building from scratch yeah, yeah. okay yeah thank you <laughs> yeah okay. Is, is the MCPU programs exposed to the programmer somehow, or there are some primitives implemented in there? There are some primitives of the system that are implemented in the in the. I MCPU. think the, uh, I think the work on that MCPU is still in progress. Like it's we haven't implemented yet. Uh, it's too early to say something about MCPU, but the fine details of it. But compute node can access MCPU. So in the plot, uh, the previous, so um, I cannot understand why the decrease on this one with media. Uh, sorry, I can please. Yeah. Uh, why is it decreasing here? Is it the time? I mean, this is the, uh, what the memory level parallelism is. Okay. So you are you are having much better locality. I mean, it's principle of locality. You are so, you are reusing. Uh, that elements again and again. So by reusing them again and again in in a long vector, uh, I mean you uh, you need to uh, I mean you can access them much more in much more fast way rather than taking. I mean you can say it in a way that you are increasing the number of elements like here. So what is x axis here? It's it's number of elements. Number of elements of X used yeah. with the principle of locality, yes. Well, it's interesting for me. I, I also had a question here it's to highlight because you said it almost behaved the same, but for me, it's it's not the same. It's, it's yeah. linearly yeah. Go, going down with yeah. a different. It's uh, linear, I don't think so. It's linear so almost it's, it's it's going like this on the other one. It's just, mm -hmm. Why it becomes it be, it behaves differently because the number of elements and that explanation that you are giving. Mm -hmm. It's the same for both cases. The difference is in the well, in the media. Yeah. Right. So why increasing the number of elements here increases the time and here decreases the time? So it is the important that for me is the thing to highlight in this graph. Okay. Because the number of elements is increasing, you know, for both. Yeah. yeah. So well, that, that, that explanation. Zero, maybe number of zeros are reduced in orange. Is, I mean, in media case. You no, know, no, I, yeah. I don't know. I, I, what yeah. I mean is that if you have the graph, it's something that you have yeah, to. Yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, without this media, this memory engine, you are actually using the, all the cache hierarchy to talk to memory. Okay. Yeah. So you, even in case of sparse matrices, you will get eventually miss, cache miss. So your time will go up, obviously. But with this, but you, with, you, with the introduction of media in the system, you are you are actually. You, you're not wasting time in cache miss and that you're dealing with vector totally different way. So that's how, I mean, you are, you're, you're not going linearly up in this with media, but actually you are going uh, not linearly down, you are going down, so reducing cycle with the number of, and that's where the principle of locality is. You know, if you want to use the number of cache misses, then you would, you reduce the data you already brought. Yeah. That's right. And this is somewhere you can explain. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's not what you're saying is wrong. It's just to, to leave clear. Right. Yeah, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. if, if media has a core, how much, how big is it compared with the. If media has a core. Yeah, core, yeah. RTLB, and prefetch. How, how big is the extra hardware that we need? Uh, we, actually, the core we have in media. It, we don't need to be like a, like a very big core. We just need a small core with few architectural extensions. We don't require that much uh, hardware in the, inside that core. So that core is just simple scalar core with few architectural extensions to support the memory intensive operations. Um, then, and then DLB? No, how, how big should be the... How big should be the extra it? area for adding media? Uh, we haven't done any analysis yet for the area. So too early to say something about area. We, we haven't done any analysis on area or because also has a memory, uh, imagine a memory inside. Right. It's no, it's not like a memory inside. It's not a it's a, it's a CPU inside that is connected with the memory to a memory mm -hmm. control interface. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, what about TLB and uh, L3 cash? You, uh, I think you tell uh, it's uh, include. Yeah, yeah, TLB is there in because you, for example, TL by TLB is inside you. You get vector requests, and those vector requests are used are mm -hmm. always in with uh, virtual addresses. So you need to translate. You need to get physical addresses. So you you will send it to TLB and get the translation. Then. Even for vector requests, mm -hmm. so we we have our own uh, DLB there inside the this mm -hmm. memory engine. And uh, L three L three two. Yeah, L three is inside. Yeah, apparently, I'm not sure. This result is not with L three. I think this this result is with L three. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but I'm not sure about L three. Yeah, three will be inside the inside the memory engine. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I have a last one. The, uh -huh. In the slide 15, you. Hello. Hello. I have a question uh, regarding this presentation. Uh, so, just now that you talked about that L3, so are you saying that uh, in this experiment that L2 is your last level cache? In this experiment, what is our last level cache? L3. And uh, apart from yes, that, yes, yes. Uh, okay. And uh, did you compute any uh, cache misses in the for the MPKI for the last level cache, uh, compared to with your with media and without media, no, we we haven't done any analysis. This the work is still in progress, as I said earlier. So okay, still much of the work still. And another progress. thing is that the near memory computing part that we have talked about. So did you deploy any uh, real on this near memory processing thing into your model, or how did you find out that uh, this near memory thing that you talked about? It's not uh, really the the wave that is around near memory computing. It's just we are offloading some memory intensive operations from compute node or other than the, this, to this memory engine because this memory engine is tightly integrated with the memory, so we can have better performance there rather than far from the memory. No, then how did you classify your applications so that uh, this one is memory bound or this one is compute bound? Based on certain metrics or parameter, what is that metrics or parameter that you have chosen? Metrics or parameters. So functions like mem copy or spin locks, we are initially deciding to to offload those those functions to MCPU, but but later on we can decide much more like a full function library for MCPU. Currently with mem copy and spin locks. Okay. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, any other question from the chat? Um, no. Okay, uh, let's see. Thanks, Mark, for his presentation. Uh, well, if nothing else to, to discuss, thank you all for being here, either online or in the, or in the room. And thank you also for the questions and let's hope this helped you to perform better in each of the yeah. events. Thank Thanks you so again. much.